Children always annoyed me. Their giggling, the unnecessary crying, and the constant demand for something they didn't even need at times. I had made up my mind right from the time I finished high school not to have any kids, no matter how pressured I felt or how much my husband wanted one. It was hard enough carrying the children for nine months, talk less of having to raise them to be responsible humans. My mother must have done a lot raising three kids, but seeing all that she went through, it was almost the whole reason I decided not to have any kids. Seven years passed and two degrees later, I was married to a man who had two kids already. It took me about two months to decide to stay with him. It didn't matter that the kids were grown and I didn't have to do the whole baby process. They were still kids, which meant I still had to yell and smile unnecessarily and be unnecessarily patient. I wasn't born for this. I had told myself several times while preparing breakfast in the morning. I have heard that love is above all things, but somehow, if there was something that could be done about the kids in such a way that I wouldn't be blamed, I would prefer it to having to wake up early to get the kids that weren't mine ready. I slumped into the chair after they left for school and my husband Matthew had gone to work. I only had to work from home, which meant I had the whole house to myself most of the time, just like I always wanted it. Silent and peaceful, void of children's noise. The TV came on after pressing a few buttons, and the first thing that appeared on the screen was the government trying to curb the act of kidnapping the children. For a minute, I felt disgusted at the sight of the image on the screen of the television but a part of me silently wished that Matthew's kids were one of those kids. I loved Matthew, no doubt, but I would love him more if there were no kids. If anything could be done to the kids, I wouldn't even mind as long as I had the perfect family I wanted for myself, the one without kids, but with Matthew. I should be able to get the number of these kidnappers somehow, I thought. The superego part of my mind immediately filled me with guilt and consciousness, but I pushed it aside. I'm definitely going through with this. The enthusiasm I felt at the moment pushed me deep into the internet until I got a company who was the top in the business. It took a mastermind to actually know that they were into the business because of how well they designed the website to be different from what they actually did but it was nothing a degree in computer science couldn't fix. I gave myself a gentle pat and logged into the website. It was filled with all what they did, from the least to the extreme. They paid a huge sum of money to anyone who brought children from below the age of 10 years to them. And lucky for me, I had two children below 10 that I could make cool money through. I chatted with one of the employees who told me how they worked and how the kids could not be collected back under any circumstances, as long as the money is paid. All good. You don't know the favor you're doing me by not being able to have them back, I typed back to the employee. I filled all the information I had to about myself and the kids and where they could pick them up with the dates without anyone noticing. And that was all. I waited patiently for Wednesday to come. It was going to be Matthew and I alone very soon. No disturbance at all. I jumped up for joy at the thought of it. Who would have thought? I screamed into the atmosphere. Wednesday came quickly and when I opened my eyes that morning, I felt guilt wash all over me, especially after I looked at Matthew's face. He had talked about the future of his kids all night. A bright smile plastered on his face as he talked about it. He loved his kids just as much as I loved him, but I couldn't bring myself to love kids as much as he did. I checked the time and it was just six in the morning, just seven hours until the end of that bright smile on his face. I got out of bed to prepare what I knew was the last breakfast I was going to be preparing for the kids, but also in gladness. I packed the food into the lunchbox. 
There was nothing I could even do about it if I wanted to do something. Because I had received the payment and telling them that I wasn't interested anymore was going to be the end of everyone in the family, not just the kids. I waved goodbye to the kids and Matthew as they got into the car. I smiled at them for the first time in forever as they waved back at me. They smiled back at me thinking I was just being a nice mother and Matthew looked happy. Knowing it was the first time I was smiling back at the kids. I checked the time continuously and when it was one in the afternoon, I received a text message of confirmation. Order received. An unknown number texted me. Finally, freedom at last. I thought, and I had barely put down my phone when Matthew walked into the house in anger with two policemen behind him. I felt my face turn to the other side from the impact of the slap he gave me. I looked at him in shock, confused about his reaction. How dare you sell my kids? How dare you? Who do you think you are trying to take away my joy like that? He yelled into my face. I saw his fist tighten again. I moved back a few feet to save myself from whatever was about to land on me again. How did he know about it? I thought the agency was secretive. I asked myself a lot of unanswered questions and only got them when I got to the police station. Apparently, the site I placed the order on was the fake one. The one created by the government to catch those who were into the business of selling kids. If you didn't want kids, you could have not married me at all. You're heartless. You would have sold two beautiful children into the cold hands of kidnappers? Damn. Matthew kept ranting. Navea, you're heartless. I knew it was the end for me. I should have known that crimes as such were not the ones to bypass the American government. I heard insults from different neighbors as the policemen walked me into the van and different phones capturing the moment. I looked around for the kids and I saw them seated at a corner, their hands intertwined in each other. I'm sorry, I mouthed to them. What? What you've done to them isn't enough? Do you want to kidnap them yourself now? Matthew screamed into my face. He was hurting and probably disappointed, but what could I say? Even after this, I wouldn't like kids. I just knew. I'm sorry. I said to him before walking into the van. I wish someone could hear the faintest cry my muffled mouth could make. It's been several hours or days since I got locked in this stinking semi-dark basement because of what I saw. I was not sure of how long I'd been kept there against my will because it seemed forever. My pain accompanied the creaking sound of the door with the thudding descent down the wooden stairs. My dad called me some weeks ago asking me when I would visit him. I've always used my job as an excuse to avoid visiting his new wife's house. I wasn't against their union in any way. It's been over five years since my mom had departed, so the old man deserved a new taste of love and companionship I knew I couldn't give. His new wife convinced him to move to her apartment upstate, somewhere close to the woods was what I didn't support. I persuaded my dad to convince her to move to our apartment in the heart of the city. She, anyway, had her way over him. My dad left the city for the woods. It was now almost a year they've been married, and I'd not seen my dad for several months because I was still avoiding his new house. We stayed connected online, as I often FaceTimed him to check on him. With his smiles during the video calls, I knew he was happy, definitely enjoying his location and, of course, his marriage. During our last video call, I told him I would visit him to see what the environment looks like and do some catch-up with him. His face suddenly turned sad. Don't you want me to come, Dad? I said. Yes, of course, I do want you to come. I can't wait to see you. Just that... He stopped abruptly, looking away from the camera. Just that what, Dad? I asked him, looking worried. Nothing, dear. Just that I miss you. He smiled and told me he had to go. We ended the call with some blown kisses. So I decided to visit him the following weekend. I called his line to inform him about my coming, but his wife picked up. Hi, Grace, she said from the end of the line. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. I was hoping to tell Dad I'd be coming over this weekend, I said with a bit of surprise. Oh, that's never a problem. We're eager to receive you. Your dad stepped out briefly. I'll tell him you called. He'll text you the address, she said. 
It was finally the weekend, and I was on my way to their house as I had planned. With the help of Google Maps and Hannah, who was waiting for me already by the roadside, I got there without any hassle. When I got in, she showed me to a seat, then offered me a glass of juice and a pie. There was beef in it. Delicious, I must confess. I asked where my dad was, and she told me there was an intruder last night. So, besides reporting over the phone, he went to see his friend, a police officer, to aid the investigation. It wasn't really convincing, but I had no reason to doubt her. She told me to make myself at home, that she needed to get something at a nearby grocery shop. So, she left the house. I stood up and walked around the living room staring at the photos on the wall. Several minutes went by, so I decided to check the house out. I went into the kitchen. After checking it, I saw the mahogany door, which an opening in it led to the basement. I descended the wooden stairs gently with my flashlight on. The basement had this foul odor, which kept me wondering what could be the source. I noticed a red and green light from the opposite direction. I shined my light toward it to see the source of the light. My light revealed it was a deep freezer. I looked around with my flashlight on, inspecting the corner briskly. I walked towards the freezer to open it, just to quench my curiosity. I opened the lid, and the freezer's bulb lit its inside. I found it filled halfway with beef, or some sort of red meat. Hmm, was what came as a mumble from my mouth. One of the pieces of meat caught my attention. I really couldn't tell what part of an animal that could be. It had frozen and had got stuck with some other meat. I tried taking it out to examine it properly. As I pulled it, it lifted the other meat stuck to it. It pulled something huge out. It was my dad's head, frozen. I screamed, flinging the phone in my hand away, and at the same time losing grip on the pounds of flesh that had pulled my dad's head out. I fell on my back still screaming and my heart racing. After a few seconds, I thought of getting my phone to run out while I dialed 911. My plan was met with a heavy blow to the head, and I went black. I woke up tied to a chair, blood trickling down my face. The room was semi-dark. I couldn't see any other person. I wouldn't know what the fate of Hannah would be in the hand of this cruel intruder. I waited in the dark for several hours till I fell asleep again. I woke up when I heard the creaking sound of the mahogany door opening. The intruder descended. It was the sound of the wooden stairs on each descent, as if someone was walking with an iron rod as support. Then the light came on. It was Hannah. She was wearing a polythene apron, a pair of gloves, and high heel shoes. It was her shoes making sound on each descent. She was holding a bag with her. She pulled a table from the corner to in front of me and settled the bag upon it. She unzipped it and revealed several torture tools. Perhaps it was a torture kit with a cordless cutting machine. She went to the side of the freezer, then pulled out a black plastic bag. She pulled a pale substance out of it, then approached me with it. She dropped the substance next to the bag. It stunk badly. She pulled out duct tape, then brought out a cyanoacrylate glue, which she was definitely going to apply on the duct tape before sealing my lips with it, I presumed. She took the stinking substance on the table and then said to me, Would you eat this easily? or I do it my way. I spat on her face. I thought as much, she said, then dealt me a heavy blow on the head. I was numb for a couple of minutes as she shoved whatever it was into my mouth, then sealed it with the tape. She then pulled out a pair of pliers from the kit. With it, she pulled out my fingernails. The pain brought me back to full consciousness. I groaned and jolted in the chair I was tied to, just as if I was being electrocuted. The movement loosened the straps on my legs. I immediately kicked her leg and she lost her balance. She tripped and hit her jaw against the edge of the table. Blood filled her mouth. She got up, infuriated by what I did. She picked up the cordless cutting tool, then powered it on. The disc rotated at a high speed with noise. She approached me with it, but before she could come too close, I used my bare foot to stamp the disc against her chest. With the rotating cutting disc in between my foot and her chest, the machine cut both of us. My foot was separated laterally. She fell upon her face, jolting upward as the machine cut deeply into her. With the little energy I had left, I loosened the rope on my hands, crawled toward the table where I picked up my phone to dial 911. 
but I couldn't say anything other than groan. A few minutes later, I heard sirens whirling. My name is Sophia, and I am an art undergrad. Trust me, I know I couldn't have picked a better major if I wanted to earn peanuts. For a course that didn't pay much, studying art cost an arm and a leg. Being dirt broke at 25 will cause you to do a lot of things that sound insane. Not only that, but being broke at 25 is also an avenue for things to happen to you. I came to know this last Saturday at Ava's house. My friend Ava lived in an apartment building uptown, unlike my apartment, which was pretty run down in all the ways that an apartment could be run down. Ava, apart from the beautiful house, had two things I didn't have, or rather couldn't afford to have, Netflix and a huge LED television with all the latest features and the most stunning display I had ever seen. Deep down, I simply hated the fact that I could not afford such things in life. So when Ava asked me if I could help house sit and take care of her dog, I didn't hesitate to say I was in. I was in school and had been bored out of my mind. I didn't have an active plan that weekend, apart from downloading shows to watch on my phone using the free-to-use piracy sites. I will be gone for three days, Ava said as she searched her handbag to give me what had to be either money or the key. To my delight, it turned out to be both. Before she left, I asked her for her home's Wi-Fi password, which she happily provided. On the first day, I did most of the chores that she asked me to do. By evening, I was almost done but was so tired, I decided that it would be wise to take a break. I sat on the couch and with a flick of a button, the television came on. I browsed through the movies and ended up just going with a random one. I started the movie and enjoyed my drink peacefully. It was a film about a guy with relationship issues. Can't really remember if I'm telling the truth. What I remember through was halfway through the movie, I began hearing voices from the opposite apartment. It wasn't the sound of ghosts or anything. It was the sound of two people who were arguing. About what? I couldn't really tell. I dismissed the sound and continued watching till I fell asleep. The second day began with me in the doorway holding the leash to Miles, Ava's dog, as we were about to go for a walk. To be honest, Miles could be a pain in the arse, but I wasn't going to complain as I had been paid well and needed all the money in the world. I was about to leave when the door opposite Ava's apartment opened. Standing at its door was a man with a big black eye. The sight caught me off guard leaving me staring at the large black mark over his left eye. You're going to walk the dog? He asked, pointing at Miles. Yes, I answered. Could you help me walk mine? Starcatcher has been getting antsy being stuck indoors, the man with the black eye said. My rejection was at the tip of my tongue and was almost out of my mouth when he said the words that caused me to pause. I can pay you, the man said. I pretended to give it a thought before giving him the answer I had already settled on immediately. More money. Wow. Seeing my face, the man shakily put his hand into his pocket and brought a wallet, holding what I would describe as a fuck ton of money. I took Starcatcher and Miles and walked through the streets before returning to the building. I knocked on the door expecting to see the man with the black eye, but it was a woman who opened the door. What do you want? The woman asked. I want to return Starcatcher, I said, offering the leash to her, which she snatched and without sparing a word, smacked the door in front of me. I sat down to watch Netflix when I started hearing some noise. If I remember correctly, it was similar to the noise I had heard last night. I went close to the door and placed my ear on it. I could hear the words being said through the door. You should be ashamed, the voice sounded. The voice died down not long after and I returned to watching until evening, and that was when the argument began again. The argument was followed by a guttural scream that caused my heart to skip a beat. I stood from the couch after the scream and slowly walked towards the door. I could feel my heart beating at a rate that couldn't have been good for my body, and it only continued as I reached closer to the door. As I swung the door open, I caught sight of the woman that I had seen earlier atop of the man. The man was not completely in his senses, like he was something. And then, what I noticed next shook me to the core. 
The woman was mercilessly squeezing the balls of the helpless man on the floor. Call 911. My mind screamed to my body, but I couldn't do anything except watch. My entire body felt stiff with disobedience. Somehow, I broke the rigor and reached for the phone in my pocket when the woman looked up and screamed at me. You bitch! Drop the phone now! She shouted as she stood up from the man's body and walked towards me. I ran back in Ava's apartment, but forgot to lock the door in a hurry. I hid behind the couch, trying to protect myself from the crazy lady. I reached for my phone, only to remember that I had dropped it in the passageway. The house went quiet before the banging began again, and an unintended scream came out of my mouth. The scream only increased as the door to Ava's house opened. The woman, she was surprisingly strong. She lifted me easily by my hair. Please don't kill me, I pleaded. You've been the bitch fucking my husband, haven't you? The woman said. No, all this has been a big misunderstanding. Shut the f*** up, not a word more. I know what all has gone into that dirty mouth of yours. I wanted to explain that I was just house sitting, but before I could get the words out, Ava's dog attacked. It didn't fill me with confidence when I heard whimpering after he was swung to the chair at the side of the living room. I ran out of the window and climbed the fire escape down where I saw a police car. The police came back with me, but the woman had disappeared as though she never existed, leaving the man in pain and Ava's dog bruised. That was the last time I allowed money to dictate my decisions.